This is uh, uh, another webinar hosted by JDCA. Uh, this one is looking at the rise of hatred and anti-Semitism under Donald Trump. We're 35 days away from the most important election of our lifetime. Our latest ad entitled, Hate Doesn't Stop Itself, It Must Be Stopped, demonstrates the true stakes of this election. This is more than just a choice between two political parties and as the voice of Jewish Democrats, we do not say that lightly. In the last year alone, anti-Semitic incidents in the United States increased by 12%, the largest increase in a single year in the last 40 years. Our democracy is eroding. The press is attacked daily, and the United States has failed to condemn, <laughs> the president of the United States has failed to condemn or act against brutal attacks against our own journalists abroad. On the streets, our president has chosen to support the efforts of unidentified law enforcement to attack protesters. Unfortunately, this sounds all too familiar. The Republican Party refuses to denounce the rise of QAnon and right-wing extremists who are being elected to Congress across the country as Republicans. Last Thursday, the Wisconsin GOP gave the mother of Colorado <coughs> the 19-year-old who fatally shot two prisoners, protesters at Kenosha, a standing ovation. And just last week, the President of the United States admitted that <clears throat> he may not accept the results of the election if he loses. The list goes on and on. We recognize the last four years in Donald Trump's presidency as what it is, the beginning of the authoritative authoritarian playbook. The erosion of democracy in the last four years of the Trump presidency should ring alarms for us as American Jews and as Americans who know the consequences of fascism and division. President Trump enables hate and is directly responsible for making our country less safe for Jews and for other marginalized communities. Trump hopes that his attacks on democracy will make us lose hope and create cynicism. But we at the Jewish Democratic Council of America are, are only more motivated to ensure he faces overwhelming defeat in November. JDCA is mobilizing Jewish voters to elect Joe Biden, win back the Senate, and increase our House majority by people that support Jewish values and things that we stand are most important to us. Our work has never been more important. I'm extremely thrilled to be joined today by noted Holocaust historian and Emory University professor Deborah Lipstadt and our executive director Haley Soifer for a discussion about hate and what we can learn from the rise of fascism in 1930s Germany. And before I do, I just want to make a personal note here. Deborah Lipstadt, Professor Lipstadt, was a teacher of mine at a, a fellowship program that uh, one of our other board members, Michael Rosenzweig, and I took many, many years ago and was an absolute influence on me and many, many, many others to even form organizations like JDCA and stand for these values and principles. So thank you, Professor Lipstadt. I'm now gonna turn it over to JDCA board member and secretary, Michael Rosenzweig. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> uh, it's my privilege today to introduce my good friend, Deborah Lipstadt. Deborah is one of those people who truly, who truly needs no introduction. Uh, I would wager that few, if any people on this call, do not know her as the preeminent Holocaust scholar of her generation. Deborah is best known as the author of a series of excellent books, Denying the Holocaust in 1993, History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier in 2005, The Eichmann Trial in 2011, and most recently, of course, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, which was published last year. Deborah is the Dorote Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies at Emory University in Atlanta. She served as a consultant to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, served two terms on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council, and among many, many honors is the winner of the National Jewish Book Award for her book, Denying the Holocaust, and the Albert D. Chernin Award from the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, which is given to an American Jew whose work best exemplifies the social justice imperatives of Judaism, Jewish history, and the protection of the Bill of Rights, particularly the First Amendment, previous recipients of which included Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, I'll also note that Deborah is going to be testifying as an expert witness in the civil suit uh, growing out of the incident in Charlottesville in 2017. Of course, she'll be testifying on anti-Semitism, her area of expertise. 
We're most fortunate to have Deborah with us today. Uh, this is the second time we've been privileged to have her on one of our national calls, and we're just thrilled that she's joining us today. Moderating our conversation today will be JDCA Executive Director Haley Soifer. Uh, before joining JDCA's Executive Director, Haley worked as a Senior Policy Advisor in the Obama administration and for several members of Congress, most recently as National Security Advisor for Kamala Harris. Um, I would invite you to submit your questions for Deborah to info at jewishdems.org, info at jewishdems.org, or you can simply post them in the chat room. Uh, I would also invite you to join the conversation on Twitter by tweeting us at US Jewish Dems and using the hashtag Jewish Dems in action. And finally, as Ron noted, the election's 35 days away clearly the most important election in our lifetimes. We invite you to get involved. There are a variety of ways you can get involved. I would encourage you to please go to our website, jewishdems.org, and you can learn much more about that. Now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Lipstead. Deborah, you're on mute. mute. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Haley. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I've decided and in conversation with uh, my partners here on the screen uh, to focus my remarks today, not on the general issue of anti-Semitism, though I'd be happy to answer questions on that, but more on the issue of comparisons to Nazi Germany, comparisons to the Shoah. Now, as some of you know, and I think a question already has been posed by uh, some of the reporters at JPA, um, uh, which we'll get to later, um, I in the past have very often decried comparisons to the Holocaust. In fact, uh, four years ago during the previous presidential campaign, I got into a big fight with someone, I think at Shabbat dinner, um, at a good friend of mine because he compared uh, uh, the then candidate Trump to Adolf Hitler. And I said, those comparisons don't work. And I was not a fan even then of uh, candidate, then candidate Trump. Also about, I guess about a year ago, uh, when uh, some members of Congress, uh, one in particular, uh, compared the uh, detention camps to concentration camps, I criticized that. I was asked about it and I criticized it. That's not to say that they're good. It's not to say that it's not to say that they're not very bad. Double negative makes a positive. Um, but I, I think we have to be careful with comparisons uh, to the Holocaust, with comparisons to Hitler, comparisons to uh, the Shoah. Um, it's as if to say nothing can be bad unless it's as bad as a Shoah. Nothing can be as terrible unless it's a genocide or a authoritarian, uh, megalomaniacal uh, le uh, elect elected of, and he was elected official such as Adolf Hitler. So you got to go to the worst place possible. Now, having said that, I do think that at this point in time, and as historians, we evolve. A good historian who never changes her mind is not a good historian. Uh, people should be allowed to change their minds and, and have their views evolve, particularly as the situation develops. Today, we could say certain comparisons are fitting. Um, Sometimes people have asked me, is this 1938 Germany? Is this Kristallnacht? Is, uh, you know, when the Unite the Right rally, as Michael mentioned, where, which I'll be an expert witness against the organizers, uh, you know, was, people ask me, is this Kristallnacht? Is this uh, a, a, a po a beginnings of a pogrom, et cetera? I don't think those comparisons are correct. However, I do think certain comparisons uh, are fitting. And in fact, uh, just last week in another conversation, I said, I don't, it's certainly not 1938 and it's not even 19, November, not, September 1935 and the Nuremberg Laws. What it well might be is December 1932. Hitler comes to power January 30th, 1933. It might even be January 15th, 1933. And for someone like uh, Professor Tim Snyder, who's, who's 
very world, well versed in this area. Um, he talks about it as mid-February 1933 when the Reichstag fire, when uh, the, uh, the fire was set to the House of Parliament, the German House of Parliament, and in response, uh, a, a, a Dutch communist was accused, but there's good reason to suspect that the Nazis had set the fire themselves, but that's, that's not the point. The point is that in response to that fire, um, uh, Hitler and the leadership of the Nazi party, then the leadership of the, Ger of the German government, um, proposed something called the Enabling Act, which essentially had the Reichstag, the German parliament, vote itself out of existence because the act said anything the uh, chancellor Hitler wants to do is all right. Um, and and in, it's very interesting, I'm not going to go into this now, but if you follow um, the way the Nazis seized power, they did it quickly and they did it uh, step by step, but I would say within less than a year after coming to power, they had control. Uh, and they started with attacks on the media, calling it the lying press. They started with attacks on the courts. Uh, firing Jewish judges, firing Jewish clerks, firing Jewish, saying Jewish lawyers couldn't practice. They began, they continued with attacks on Jewish teachers and Jews in academia. Jews in academia were increasingly forced out of their positions. Jewish teachers were fired. It was step by step. And if you look back at it in a sort of holistic fashion, what, well, it, what it was, was an attack on the institutions, which really are the pillar of democracy. Remember, Germany had been a democracy, short-term democracy, but nonetheless a democracy uh, when Hitler came to power, when Hitler was elected. So um, I would say in the attacks we're seeing on um, the press, the courts, academic institutions, elected officials, and even, and most chillingly, the electoral process, that this deserves comparisons. And I'm going to preempt one question, which has been on Twitter, posted by someone named Matt Brooks, I believe, who works with uh, the Jewish Republicans or whatever, um, maybe wanting to goad me but into an answer, but uh, uh, a question about uh, Vice President Biden's comparison of Donald Trump, of President Trump, to Yosef Goebbels. And actually, I think it's a very valid comparison. He didn't compare him to Hitler. He didn't compare him to Himmler. He didn't compare him to um, Heydrich, who was the who ran the Von Say conference in uh, January '42, which planned the how the final solution would be executed. He compared him to the propaganda chief, um, to the propaganda chief of the Nazis, who wrote and 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 taught his followers. Um, that you repeat a lie and you repeat it and you repeat it. And especially if it's a big lie, you go big. You don't do little lies. Don't waste your time with little lies. Go with big lies and you repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it so that even people who in the beginning thought, oh, that is ridiculous. The more they hear it, the more they begin to believe it. Uh, so uh, Goebbels was very successful at what he did. And I think the, the comparison by Vice President Biden was a very apt comparison because we're seeing a lot of that now. So um, I, I doubt that Matt Brooks is on this call, but if one of his friends or acolytes is, tell him what I said. Um, so again, I'm, I'm gonna bring it together here. Comparisons are fitting, but not every, something doesn't have to be as bad as a Shoah to be bad. Um, uh, for instance, the, the detention camps I thought were, were a black mark, a dark mark on, on the ethics and the history and the policies of America, but they weren't a genocide and you've got to differentiate. Um, but uh, some of the attacks we're seeing now uh, leave me very nervous. And the last point I want to make just in terms of anti-Semitism in general, and something maybe many people on this call have heard me say before, 
that the reason to be frightened by anti-Semitism, which is rising in this country on both the right and the left, and it should be condemned on both the right and the left, and no excuses should be made uh, for anti-Semitism on the left. In fact, the one place the far left and the far right meet is on the issue of anti-Semitism, and we've seen that in history many times, not just in this uh, contemporary period. But the reason to be frightened by and concerned by anti-Semitism, certainly if you're a Jew, it's your, to use the Talmudic expression, it's your ox who's being gored. So of course you're gonna be concerned about it. The victim is always most concerned. But that's not, I think, the fundamental reason to be against it. And many people are, are frightened by and against it because they have Jewish grandchildren, Jewish children, in-laws, family, neighbors. Certainly a good reason, but not a sufficient reason. Um, many people are, are frightened by anti-Semitism because they're, they are absolutely riled by any forms of prejudice and hatred. All good reasons, but the real reason that this rise in anti-Semitism should leave all Americans who value democracy chilled, nervous, concerned, is that I know of no healthy democracy, which um, tolerated within it the existence of anti-Semitism and remained a healthy democracy. Uh, when you fail to condemn QAnon, when you say there were nice people on both sides at Charlottesville, I'm sorry, nice people do not march through the streets with Tiki torches, which is in a, a, something popularized by Goebbels in his torchlight parades. They do not march through the streets with tiki torches chanting, Jews will not replace us. They do not chant blood and soil, which is Blut und Boden, uh, a, a Nazi symbol that Jews were not of our blood and not a, a part of our soil, not from our, uh, uh, you know, there were foreigners, even though the, the Jews had been in Germany at that point by, for a thousand years, practically. Um, uh, you don't do, those aren't nice people. Um, and to say that, or to fail to, to condemn QAnon, even if they are supporting you, is, is exactly what they're waiting for. Uh, during the last campaign uh, to take, I think it was two weeks, maybe it was only a week, to condemn David Duke when uh, then candidate Trump was asked about um, David Duke supporting him and was asked, do you, do you eschew that? Do you reject that? And he said, well, I don't know much about David Duke. The truth is that he had already counseled the Republican Party that they shouldn't build their future on the likes of David Duke. Um, to fail to say, I don't care if they like me. I don't care if they support me. This is not healthy for American dem democracy. This is not how our present and certainly our future should be built. Um, Elie Wiesel taught, uh, Elie was a good friend, there's a picture of him I, I see now in, in, in the, um, behind me. Um, but Elie taught, and was one of his, his fundamental teachings in that in the fight between good and evil, there are only two sides. There are no bystanders. You can't say, oh, I'm okay on that, but not okay on that. They know yes, buts. Yes, that's anti-Semitic. Yes, that's fueling anti-Semitism, but I still like him or whatever. There's only one side, the right side and the wrong side. Thank you so much, Professor Lipstadt. We are grateful for your insight and for uh, sharing your thoughts today. We have quite a few questions. Our first comes from Ron Campius from the Jewish Telegraph Agency, or JTA. The JDCA ad, which we showed at the outset of this call, uses Holocaust imagery as a means of impugning Donald Trump. When Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez seemingly used Holocaust imagery to denounce migrant detention camps, Dr. Lipset said it was inappropriate because it allowed people doing wrong to piously say they were being unfairly maligned. Is that not true in the case of the new JDCA ad? What justifies the use of Nazi era imagery in this case, and I would just note that we do not use Holocaust imagery. No, uh, in no. this ad, we use Nazi 
era imagery. Yes, use Nazi era imagery and you use an image. One I think actually comes from Lenny Riefenstahl's film um, Triumph of the Will, I believe that with the crowd scene was from that, which is all a, an example of Nazi propaganda. It is a film that Hitler adored. It is a film that Goebbels uh, paid for and uh, adored. Um, and it was all about how the, not the Nuremberg rallies and Nazi propaganda. There was also a film, I, uh, a clip, I believe, of painting a Jewish star on a, uh, a Jewish shop and the word, putting the word Yuda under it. It's again showing how the public's hatred can be um, whipped up against Jews. Um, had the ad contained imagery of the Shoah, I wouldn't be here today. So uh, Ron, my answer is, I think uh, uh, Representative Alexandra uh, Ocasio-Cortez was wrong in that comparison. I uh, abhor the detention camps, but to call them concentration camps, especially to link it to Nazi era concentration camps is wrong. Doesn't make, them, doesn't make the detention camps right. It just isn't a good historical analogy. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve in Illinois. Can you articulate a test or standard to help us determine when comparisons to the Holocaust or 1930s Germany are appropriate and when they step over the line? Yeah, I think they, you know, I, I was trying to lay that out. I can't give you a hard and fast line uh, a determination, Steve, uh, because things don't work that way. But I, I, you have to ask yourself, certainly if you're making a comparison to the Shoah and comparing Nazi authoritarian Nazi Germany and the Shoah are, certainly the Shoah came out of and was supported by and created by and the brainchild of um, uh, Nazi, Nazi leadership, Hitler in particular, but all those around him. Um, but we're not talking, I, I'm not afraid that Jews are going to be rounded up and marched off or uh, particularly targeted. In fact, it's other groups now and other individuals who are more targeted. I mean, one of the reasons I started to wear a Jewish star uh, not long ago or about, I guess, last fall was because I suddenly realized I had a choice to pass and I didn't want to pass. But we Jews have choices to pass, which other minority groups, certainly Blacks, many Latinos, et cetera, don't have. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't fear uh, uh, physical assaults. In fact, here's the difference between um, uh, what we're seeing today and, and a Shoah. Here, the hatred is coming not from the government itself, but the government is enabling it or the leadership is enabling it. By failing to condemn it, you give a wink, wink, nod, nod, dog whistle, call it what you may, to those who believe QAnon uh, is correct. And by the way, you might say QAnon, well, it doesn't really talk about Jews, it talks about other conspiracies, etc at the heart of conspiracy theories like that, almost without exception, you find anti-Semitism. When they talk about rich Dems, Democrats are controlling it, you should know that that is a code word to most of their followers, to Jews. And when they talk about George Soros, George Soros is the Rothschild of the 21st century. When they talk about George Soros controlled kinds of things and working behind the scenes, that is a code word. Maybe not to the many of the people on this call and maybe not to many American Jews, but to their followers, that's a code word to Jews. So Steve, what I would say is be careful of your comparisons. Um, it's better to pull back than to go overboard. And I know there was a lot of discussion amongst uh, this organization, Jewish Democrats uh, and the council about using and concern about using that imagery. Um, and one of the reasons I'm here is to contextualize it. Um, but uh, what we're seeing is, a, is an authoritarian, I don't wanna say fascist, but with, with reminiscent of fascisty kind of assaults on democracy. And democracy is a very fragile thing. Democracy making, means making a world safe for the weakest among us. That's what Ruth Bader Ginsburg was all about. That's what her career was all about. Um, and so many others, of course, she was not alone, but she's so much in her minds, our minds now. Um, 
So that's, that would be my guidance on the comparison. And if you have a real issue, shoot me an email. Too many people have my email, so you'll find it. Thank you. Shira from Arizona asks, is there a direct link between the demise of democracy and the rise of anti-Semitism? To what extent are we as American Jews the canary in the coal mine when it comes to uh, the demise of democracy here in the United States? Absolutely, there's a link. It's not the only link, but it's a very distinct link. Um, Anti-Semitism is delusional. Anti-Semitism believes all Jews believe the same thing, all Jews act the same way, any ism, any prejudice believes that. Anti-Semitism believes Jews, though small in number, are controlling, they're the behind the scenes, it always depicts the Jew, and that's the Soros, the Soros, uh, or, or sometimes the Rothschild kind of thing, or the Jew, the media. You know, uh, all, all those kind of things are code words, maybe, again, not to many American Jews, but to the people who are convinced by it, absolutely those code words. Um, so um, I think that that's, you know, always listen for those code words and know that um, when you, these conspiracy theories, um, because that's unlike, you know, anti-Semitism is a prejudice like racism, homophobia, many other isms. But, and, and in that sense, it has many things to compare it. But, um, and again, people have heard me say this, but I'll, I'll reiterate, uh, the racist punches down. The racist says the black person, the person of color is lesser than. If, they, if their kids go to our kids' school, there goes the school. If they move into our neighborhoods, there goes the neighborhood. Where, whereas the anti-Semite punches up. The Jew is all powerful. The Jew has the ability to control behind the scenes. This all has its roots in, uh, in, in Christian anti-Semitism, and I don't have time, of course, to go into that. But the whole, de the idea that the Jews, though small in number, were able to engineer the death of Jesus. Of course, Jesus was a Jew, the Jews were Jews, but that doesn't matter. That's how the story is been taught. Or the Jews are small in number, but they brought the plague. Small in number, but they poisoned the wells. Small in number, but they caused the economic crashes in the 19th century and even in the 20th century. So these conspiracy theories have at their heart an anti-Semitic theme, now increasingly implicit, not explicit. But listen carefully and you'll hear the code words. Great. Uh, we have a question from Jackie B. She asks, what do you think Trump will do if he actually wins the election? And I would add to this, if we've seen this rise of anti-Semitism and his emboldening of white nationalism uh, as he's about to face uh, the American voters again, do you think that would change once he has the mandate, if he has the mandate of former? You know, I'm a historian. Uh, I always, I look at the past and try to figure out what the past means. I'm too smart to try to predict. The Talmud teaches that after the completion of the Tanakh, uh, a prophecy was left to children and few, few fools. So I'm neither a child and hopefully not a fool. So I'm not going to try to predict. But what I I'm willing to say is that, and because we've seen it already, so I'm not predicting anything, I think it's just going to get stronger, we'll see the emboldening, the uh, feeling of, you know, uh, of, of, of by far right wingers, by extremists, by anti-Semites, wherever it's coming from, uh, but particularly from this time from the anti-Semites on the right. Look, we're one day after Yom Kippur, last year on Yom Kippur, uh, but for a lock on the door, and I believe a JDC grant to, to reinforce the, the door of the synagogue in Halle, there would have been the biggest massacre on the German soil since 1944-45. Um, that's chilling. And the murderer there, who did murder two people outside the synagogue, both of them happened not to be Jews, but their death is, is a tragedy. He thought they were Jews. The murderer there spouted the same evils that we heard spouted by the murderer in Pittsburgh, spouted by the murderer in Poway, San Diego at the Chabad synagogue, uh, and spouted by Dylan Roof at Mother Emanuel Church in, in, Char in um, 
Charleston and spouted by the killer in the Walmart in El Paso. This is part of a package. And these peop the people associated with this are looking for wink, wink, nods, nods. And when a president says, I don't know much about QAnon, but they support me, what more of an imprimatur can you expect? Um, and I, so I don't know, I have no idea what the president will do in terms of his policies and, and his actions, but I can tell you that these groups will feel emboldened. And on a more depressing note, uh, the next thing I'm going to say is not depressing. Should uh, Vice President Biden win, that's not depressing. But the depressing part is that these groups are not going to disappear. This is a hate. And when hate comes out of the can, when hate comes out, out of the darkest recesses from the nooks and crannies, the, the dusty, dark, evil corners of our society, it isn't so easily put back. Um, we have a tremendous job in front of us and a tremendous challenge because there are people who uh, feel that what they, the hatred they're feeling is legitimate, the hatred they're feeling is right. Thank you. Uh, Ruth D asks, is democracy the only or the necessary protection against genocide? I think it's both. I think it's both. I know of uh, no genocide in a truly democratic country. Um, it's, it's the only and it's absolutely necessary because democracy says, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the weakest among you are to be protected. That doesn't mean they get to have their way. It doesn't mean they get to decide what is, but they have an equal standing in society. The minute you have a ruler, an authoritarian ruler, um, who says, I'm good to my people, and maybe he's good to the, maybe he, I'll, I'll make it he, though there have been she's, maybe he's um, uh, good to, to the, the minorities there, but it's a goodness that comes from him, and should he decide to change his mind, then it goes away. You know, I'm reminded when I say this um, of the example given by my uh, late teacher, Professor Nachum Sarna, the great, great biblical scholar. And in his book, he was either in, I think it was in Exploring Exodus, where he talks about the Shabbat. He said that there were ancient Near Eastern societies which had a day of rest, even before what we think Jews instituted, uh, the Shabbat was instituted amongst what would become Jews, amongst Israelites. There were other ancient Near Eastern societies, which we know from evidence had days of rest, but they were always a gift of the ruler. So the ruler could decide to take them away. The ruler could decide, I don't want everybody to have a day of rest anymore. Only landowners, only the people I like will have a day of rest. The Jewish Shabbat is for everyone. You, your, your, your members of your family, the people who work for you, even your animals. It transcends an individual. Democracy transcends an individual. How was that for a little Torah lesson there in the middle? <laughs> Wonderful. And since I know you have to go shortly, we'll ask our last question. It comes from Adam Greenwald. Any advice for young Jewish people going off to college and encountering and responding to anti-Semitism? It's a hard one because what's happened on the campus, look, most, most students who will get the campus will not encounter anti-Semitism. But if you begin to openly identify as a Jew, if you begin to openly identify as a supporter of Israel, even as a critic, you know, maybe someone to the, a critic of the contemporary government, some of the contemporary policies, you'll encounter it. Some of what you'll encounter is a criticism of Israeli policies, which is not ipso facto anti-Semitism. You go to any cafe, certainly in Tel Aviv and even parts of Jerusalem, and you'll hear the criticism of Israeli policies. Israelis are the most self-critical people in the world. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I think you should know that uh, you've got to be prepared. You've got to be able to stand your ground. And, you know, some, my, some of my students once in a while have said to me, well, you know, if I openly took issue, uh, I don't think those kids would be my friends. And I said to them, if those kids have those kind of views and are willing to say those things, 
I don't think you want them as your friends. And don't ever be afraid to stand up for what you believe. So I think that's what I would say uh, to that student. And Haley, I apologize for leaving early, but I've got to go vote. Um, I'm going to get verklempt when I say this, um, because uh, for many, many years, I had the privilege of voting for John Lewis. And now I got to go vote for his temporary replacement. But if what I'd say to those kids on campus is make sure you've registered, make sure you vote, vote as if your life depended on it. Vote as if democracy depended on it, because it does. Thank you so much, Professor Lipstadt. We would never stand in the way of anyone going to vote. Uh, and we are so grateful for the time that you've taken to share your views with us this afternoon. We are 35 days away from the most important election of our lifetimes. And for some of you, with early and absentee ballots, it's already begun. We have several opportunities for you all to join us as we near this election. Tonight and tomorrow, we will convene our weekly phone banks around the country to mobilize the Jewish votes. This is from 5.30 to 8.30 every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. And tonight at 7.30 Eastern, we have an event with Senator Sherrod Brown to talk about the debate. Tonight at 9 p.m., of course, will be the first presidential debate. Just go to jewishdems.org slash events and join us. We are organizing in advance of this election and hope you all can join us by supporting JDCA. We have 35 days, we're doing everything we can and we encourage you all to do the same. Thank you so much, Professor Lipset, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. You're welcome. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Shana Tova. Thank you. Shana Tova.